Let's pray. Father, we just come into your presence this day with hearts of gratitude for what you've done for us. And Lord, as we, um, as we meditate on the things that, are, that may be difficult for us to grasp, we pray that you'd open our hearts to transform us and change us into the image of your son. And to his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Well, if you feel lonely, you are in good company. So a recent survey, a global survey with 142 nations, about 33% of adults worldwide experience loneliness. And Brazil had the highest percentage with 50% of respondents saying that they feel lonely often, always, or sometimes. 50%. Now, that compares with 31% of Americans, and that's pretty high, isn't it? Now, a different study from 2022 uh, of U.S. adults found that nearly a quarter thought that loneliness was a national crisis. So think of this. In a world where we expend so many resources, so much money, so many messages to encourage people to get along with each other, the result is loneliness. We're lonely. And it's a sad thing because, you know, God never intended us to be lonely. In fact, he's inviting us to be part of his family of love as his children, where we find in his presence our true selves and the longing of our hearts. Turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 8. This is our New Testament reading, and we're looking at verses 12 through 17 today. That's not the right sermon slide, so you don't need to have that sermon slide up. That's, that's next week. <laughs> They're getting ahead of ourselves. I'm, like, oh, well, I'm not preaching on that today, so here we go. But you'll see what I'm preaching on. So today is Trinity Sunday. If you, if you, didn't, get, if you didn't sense that, today is Trinity Sunday. So, so every year, the church sets aside a special day when we remember that we worship a God, uh, one God in three persons, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and it's called Trinity Sunday. Now, the Trinity is actually one of the most important of Christian doctrines, but it's probably the hardest for us to grasp. I mean, even for Christians, we don't really fully understand it. But we were, if we were Muslims, we would have a much better sense of, of who God is. You know, uh, the first pillar of Islam says there is only one God, Allah. And for Muslims, they look at Christians and they say, well, they're just tritheist. They worship three gods. And in fact, this is what the Trinity, the uh, Quran says. It says, say not Trinity, desist It is better for you, for God is one God. Now, that's a clear distinction, isn't it? One God, and then here we are with our our Trinity on the other side. Now, let's be clear. When, When God gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20, the very first commandment insisted that Yahweh alone is the God of the Israelites. And then in Isaiah 46, 9, we find this announcement from the Lord. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. And Jesus will reiterate this in John chapter 17, 3, when he told his disciples, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you sent. Now, as Christians, we believe in one God, okay? We believe in one God. We are monotheists. So we're not tritheists, we're monotheists. And yet, the biblical evidence reveals that God works in our lives through three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, 
and the Holy Spirit. And so the Trinity allows the individuality of each person to be maintained while insisting that each person shares in the life of the other. The Trinitarian nature of God serves as a model for how he created those who ruled the earth to live their lives, we human beings. In other words, he's a Trinitarian God because he's modeling for us how he wants human beings to live in his presence. And there, he models this in several different ways. First, the Trinity is a model of unity in the Spirit. Now, in Romans chapter 8, Paul describes two contrasting approaches to life. Now, notice that at the very beginning. One way is to live according to the flesh. And this is the way that human beings live apart from God. When we live according to the flesh, we live for what we desire. We're God of our own lives. God doesn't influence our choices and behaviors. We live as if there is no God. As professing Christians, there is a danger of allowing our flesh to rule over our lives. A danger that Paul obviously believed was real as he writes this in verse 13. He says, if you live according to the flesh, you will die. Now, you might be asking yourselves, well, wait, you know, if you're a Christian, you're going to live forever, right? And yet Paul is writing this. What Paul is pointing out is that true regeneration comes from an encounter with the living God through Jesus Christ, who then transforms our lives. We put our faith in him, and then Jesus transforms it. If it hasn't, and we're still living as slaves to our cravings, then we really haven't been born again in Christ. We might have attended church for a lot of years, but if we're still being led by the cravings of our flesh, we really haven't been born again. And for so many living in the flesh, feelings of loneliness may be the result of alienation from God pointing that something is not right in their lives. And so if you feel lonely, don't ignore it. Don't just kind of suppress those feelings. God gives us feelings for a reason. He's telling you that something is wrong. Now, there's another way of living that Paul points out, and it operates very differently, and it's called living according to the Spirit. Now, to live in this way means putting away the deeds that come out of our fleshly desires and to be led by the Spirit of God. But we can't do this on our own. You can't just say one day, hey, I'm going to follow the Spirit. It doesn't work that way. You know, some people say, I'm spiritual, and they think that if they just kind of, you know, it, you know put enough energy, they can just follow this spiritual energy. No, we must be recreated in a way that only God himself can carry out. And it comes out of the nature of our triune, of God's triune existence. Now, we have said that there's only one true God, and so that is true. But this one God exists as three persons. So the Father created us. He created us so that we would know him and that we walk our lives before him. And yet because our, our, our ancestors rebelled against him, every one of us are born separated from the one that created us. The Father, out of love for us, devised a way for us to be reconciled to him and incorporated into his family. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, into the world and through his teachings, miracles, and ways of life, he revealed to us what the Father is like. 
Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And then Jesus laid down his life as a sacrifice for us so that whoever would believe in him could be reconciled to the Father. This is the step that is needed for reconciliation with the Father. We must confess that we need a Savior, that we cannot live our lives as we've been doing, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. We must become his disciples and conform our lives to his will. When we put our faith in Jesus, the Father sends his Holy Spirit to dwell inside of his disciples. He is our helper. And he's the one that reveals truth to us and shows us how to live in a completely new way. And therefore, salvation is actually an invitation into the communal life of the Trinity. So when we become disciples of Jesus, God makes us into a new creation that will increasingly reflect his nature, both individually and as a community. Since God is a social trinity, a plurality of unity, The ideal of humankind consists in being part of a community of various people united by a common spirit. Have you ever thought about that the church is actually a reflection of Trinitarian existence? That that we're mirroring the Trinity when we're together as one body. Orthodox theologian John Zizalulis says that there is no true being without communion. Nothing exists as an individual in itself. We exist as God himself exists. We take on God's way of being, a way of relationship with other people and with God. Now, this doesn't mean that we abandon our individuality. That we're, that, you know, it's not like Buddhism where you kind of, you give up everything and you just kind of become united with this, uh, with this entity. It's not like that. We are still our individuals. In fact, the distinction of persons is an essential aspect of genuine community. You know, we've heard people say that they were afraid. I've heard people say they were afraid of becoming Christians because they thought they'd have to give up their uniqueness. You know, they couldn't keep their edge anymore. But that's not true. In Christ, we exist as distinct individuals in community with God and one another. And this is made possible through the Holy Spirit dwelling amongst us. He unifies us and makes us one. Now, besides serving as a model of our unity in the Spirit, the Trinity provides us with a model of love. So to understand God as community of persons helps us to grasp that God truly is love. So love is only love if there's an object of love, right? You can't say, well, I'm a God of love, and yet you don't you know, love you know, someone or something, right? So, so before creation, was God a God of love? Well, if there was not a trinity they would not have been an object of love. And so how could he have been inherently a God of love? The Father loves the Son and the Spirit. And they love the Father and they love each other. They are a community of love. And similarly, when we become disciples of Jesus, God adopts us as his beloved children into his family of of love. The Spirit creates an intimacy between us and the Father. As Paul says in verse 16 of Romans 8, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Through the Spirit, our adoption and transformation into a new creation becomes complete. 
If the Father's love is the inspiration for new life, and if the Son's sacrifice is the means to achieve reconciliation, then the Spirit's presence is the confirmation that we now belong to a new family, being made into a new creation. And so it's the work of each person of the Trinity that makes our adoption as children possible. And now we live as a community according to the Spirit and reject the rule of the flesh in our lives. Now, the community of love that God invites us into through salvation in Jesus stands in contrast to human communities established in the flesh. So in the flesh, you know, people don't really, don't really connect with people outside of, well, their own families or those that are different from themselves. So I remember when I was a Peace Corps volunteer serving in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And, and I remember you know, I would travel sometimes to isolated villages and, and inevitably children would see me and they would run to their parents crying, ghost, ghost. <laughs> Now, most of the time, my presence wasn't that disturbing. But I can tell you, as I walked along the road, even the town that I was in, people would regularly greet me with, Mbote Mandeli, hello, white man. They wanted me to know that I was not like them. I was the outsider. But in Africa, it doesn't matter what color you are, uh, even between those of different tribes, there existed an animosity toward each other you know, if you belong to another tribe, you were different than, than they were. And that's why we tend to enter into community with those who look like us, those that have the same beliefs as us, um, those that behave the same way, all of that, you know, that's, that in the flesh, we gravitate toward those who are like us. And even within the church, you know, we tend to worship with people who look and act like us. The Trinity as a community of love, though, stands in contrast to, to these typical human communities. It's a community of diversity. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit embracing each person as vital and necessary. When we become disciples of Jesus, we share in this new kind of community. God transforms us into a community of people from all nations, races, and demographics. In Christ, we exist as distinct individuals in community with God and his people from around the world. This is just a local body, but it's actually, you know, we're actually part of a universal church, a Catholic church that, that embraces people of every nation, of every tribe. And that's why Jesus said in John 13, 35, by this all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And that's because that love is actually miraculous. It's not, like, it's not loving people that are like you. It's loving, it's the ability to create unity and love amongst people who are different from yourself. It's a miracle that only the Spirit can create. Do you see that? It's the spirit that unites the Trinity and creates unity in the diversity of person. And it's that same spirit that unites people from all these different backgrounds from around the world and languages and everything else and, and makes them into one people. And there's love. And when people outside see that love, they know these are the disciples of Jesus. How can you have unity? You're so different. How can this be? They will know you because we're disciples of Jesus. That's what it says. Now, perhaps the best description for how we reflect the Trinitarian uh, existence of love is found in 1 Corinthians 12, where Paul writes in verses 4 through 6, Now there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are a variety of services, but the same Lord. 
There are varieties of activities, but the same God who empowers them all in everyone. In other words, each of us is unique with different personalities, gifts, and talents, and yet we're interconnected through the Spirit of God dwelling inside of us. Each of us is essential to the proper working of the whole. We have unity and diversity made possible through God's love for us. Only a relationship with the triune God can genuinely transform human beings into one family. But we first must be adopted as children of God if we're to be unified as one people. You can't do this with people who, are, who, are, who don't bow their knee before Jesus, right? It, it's what happens when we do bow our knee before Jesus, that we've humbled ourselves and the spirit of God dwells inside of us and begins to transform us. This is the real way God intends us to live, guys. We're to live as a community, a diverse community of people from all nations, and yet we love each other as family. That's the way that we're intended to live. We're not meant to live in loneliness anymore. God has invited us into his family and to be heirs of his wonderful riches because they're for all of us. Now, so we've seen that the Trinity serves as a model for, for union in the Spirit, and we've seen it that this, the, it, it's a model for love. But the, the Trinity is also a model of hospitality and mission. Now, while God's nature embraces his family in love, his is not a closed family, one that, that's, that isn't open to strangers. In fact, the triune God actively pursues relationship with those that are outside, those not yet part of the family. He's a God of hospitality. And, and we see this early on you know, in the Old Testament when the Israelites were supposed to show compassion to, to, to those, that were, uh, those that were not Jews, and yet they were to be treated well, Egyptians that may have followed them in the journey. Because... That was the way the triune God works. He's open to strangers. And so as we consider our relationship with the three persons of the Trinity, it becomes apparent that God is ascending God. The Father sent his Son into the world to rescue creation. And then his Spirit. He sent his Son to give us the Spirit to empower his people into the world. And so, in this way, the Trinity models for us a hospitality. In the same way that God sent his Son and he sent his Spirit, he sends us into the world. And our mission consists in fulfilling the mission of the Son, a mission to reconcile those not yet part of the family because God loves them and he wants to bring them uh, into the family. Now, that mission may sound daunting, but the reason it is is because we often feel like I have to do it on my own. And that's the wrong picture. It's a mission that we carry out together as a family in relationship to one another. Just as, just as the, our triune God goes out and, and, and into the world reaching people and so we do the same thing, but we're, we're doing that with one another. We are never alone in the Lord. We have all the resources of the triune God. And we have one another, our family. Look around. This is your family. This is your family. And I'm going to say more than your blood family. Because this is your family for eternity. This is your family. And so Trinity Sunday is a special day 
because it's a day to celebrate our God who, who exists as a community and invites us to join him into his eternal existence, an existence where we're always meant to be a part of in a world filled with division and suspicion and loneliness. It is the only way human beings will know genuine peace, acceptance, and love. You are not meant to be lonely anymore. God is inviting you into his family to be there eternally. Amen.